in terms of topics, not in days. We're most of the way through the journey, but what we're going to start looking at now is remote access VPN. We'll start off with the simplest approach, which isn't necessarily the simplest for the admins, but it would be the simplest for the users. If your users want a VPN into the office, all they need is a browser. They can go into their address bar. They can type, you know, perhaps webvpn.yourdomain.com. And when they get there, they'll be greeted by, you know, a web server. That web server, in most circumstances, is going to be an ASA, but iOS can do this as well. The idea here is that when someone comes in, we're going to use an SSL session to provide us our privacy. And as far as the level of interaction that we're going to contain uh, or, or provide, all that will be contained inside of a web page. So we're going to do a little bit of HTML. ASA gives you an HTML editor where we can basically create a landing page for the user. They're going to communicate with that landing page through an SSL session, you know, thus making it private. And then we're going to have access to internal resources behind the firewall through this HTML interface. Does it have to be HTML? No, we can start to support other applications. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that we're going to do that. So let's go ahead and dive in. So as I was drawing out previously, we want to give the end user the ability to simply access a browser and from their browser securely get access to internal resources. Um, what's going to give us that security is the SSL, more appropriately deemed uh, TLS or transport layer security, between the end user and the firewall. When you get to the firewall, we can tie into the ASA's AAA capabilities. What does that entail? Well, a lot. If we tie our ASA into the identity services engine, we have, <laughs> it's not an infinite amount of parameters, but there's more than you will have time to ever configure uh, stored away in that ICE. What is ICE? It's a series of if and then conditions for granting access. It used to be that having the right username and password was enough to get you access into the environment. What we're doing now is we're looking a little bit at the context of the, of the access attempt. So, okay, the username and password look good, but what type of device is it? Where are they coming from geographically? Now, let's do a GIP lookup. Is it domestically within the US or is it outside of it? Um, is the access wired or wireless? Um, is it a corporate owned device or not? Is it you know, mobile or, or, or desktop? What type of product are we looking at? Now, based on what we see, that doesn't mean that they'll be granted access or not granted access, but it determines a varying level of access. If they're coming from a corporate owned laptop, from a wired connection, their system is up to date, then maybe I give them the greatest level of access. Um, if I see things I don't like, I may back off and put them into a quarantine VLAN. There's a lot of different things that we can do. When you want to get really granular with this, that's where that AnyConnect agent comes in. It's got some NAC capabilities, that's network admission control. So it can look around at the endpoint, determine the state of it, tell it to the ASA. ASA can pass that to ICE. It can make a more informed decision. Simply using client lists, we can still tie into an external identity server, and we can look at some criteria. You can always consider things like time of day and the entry point that the user is trying to come into. Is it an ASA? Is it a router? Which office is it at? And we can create policies based on that. But clientless VPN gives the end user, I would say, the least reliable method of access because if you want to do what they call legacy applications, so think RDP, VNC, FTP, anything that's not uh, a web application, you know, just that's going to work inside of a browser, you've got to rig it up to be tunneled through. And there's little caveats that you can hit. Using a traditional uh, IPsec client or SSL client like AnyConnect, it's going to establish a tunnel interface. It's going to have some routes in the local endpoints routing table. And native applications work the way that they should. We can rig client lists up a couple different ways, but they tend to not be that reliable. So from an administrative perspective, um, it's a little bit harder to set up application support, but we can lock things down pretty easily. I'll show you how to do it. Um, from an end user perspective, you can get access to some applications, but not all of them. So from an operations perspective, the client list is not my favorite uh, VPN format. However, it really depends on what you're trying to do. And this is something that the exams will drive home. If you're a non-technical user, if you're in sales, HR, 
marketing, if all of your tools are web-based, or maybe you just need to get to email, or maybe some PDFs to do quotes, these are excellent candidates for clientless SSL VPN. When you're the Linux admin, when you need to work on the F5 firewalls, if you're a developer that wants to check in or check out source code, these are examples of people that should have a full tunnel, not clientless. But clientless is very simple for limited access.